Coming up on DTNS, big tech gets targeted with a world tax. Instagram is no longer a photo app, and Amazon is part of the Rebel Alliance. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 1st, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking about Twitter's uh, new test feature that they they uh, introduced as an idea, facets, giving you personas under which you could tweet under your main account. If you'd like that wider conversation, get Good Day Internet, become a member, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google opened up Android's integrated passes system to support local uh, storing vig digital vaccine cards from healthcare providers, local governments, or other organizations authorized to distribute them. They will be supporting them. The card will show what vaccine was received and when, and the card won't be saved to the cloud or used for advertising purposes. Oh, well, speaking of, all 27 EU member states, along with Switzerland, Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein, have officially begun rolling out a digital COVID certificate which will provide a locally stored QR code with COVID-19 vaccine information that will exempt the holder from testing or quarantine when crossing an international border. Paper versions of the certificate will be available through official, though officials warn it does not qualify as a travel document like a passport. You still need a passport. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, or CISA, released a ransomware readiness assessment module for cybersecurity evaluation tool. Say that three times fast. It's a self-assessment tool to help organizations figure out how well prepared they are to recover from a ransomware attack. It's meant for IT as well as operational technology and industrial, industrial control systems. The assessment adapts questions based on the responses in tiers of basic, intermediate, and advanced, and then offers steps to improve readiness. Facebook, Google, Twitter, and TikTok have all signed a pledge from the World Wide Web Foundation to change their moderation systems in order to better address online gender-based violence. The company's pledge to provide more granular settings for curating feeds, give users the ability to track and manage reports of abuse, and provide more guidance on how to report abuse. Prior to Jeff Bezos stepping down as Amazon CEO and handing the reins over to Andy Jassy, it's coming this coming Monday, the company is adding two new leadership principles to it is its existing 14 principles designed to guide Amazon's day-to-day -day operations. The new principles are, number one, strive to be Earth's best employer, and number two, success and scale bring broad responsibility. Amazon mm. previously added its 14th principle back in 2015, it's been a while, that one was learn and be curious. Um, all right, well, Let's find out what Earth's best employer or the company striving to be that uh, is up to in our first of these main discussion stories, Justin. Curious leadership uh, point for somebody who wants to go to space. But anyway, Bloomberg well, sources say uh, that, they're, uh, that, that for more than a year, Amazon has held talks with several workplace productivity app makers about forming a rebel alliance to take on Microsoft where Amazon Web Services would be offered in partnership with a bundle of business applications sold for a single price. These potential partners allegedly include Dropbox, Slack, and Smartsheet, among others. This alliance could potentially take on Microsoft 365 suite, which bundles office productivity apps, emails, Microsoft Teams, among other tools. I can hear Google over there shouting, you're, you're taking us on too, don't forget. Yeah. We're, we're us, also really big. Us too. Uh, yeah, this is this is a uh, this this is very interesting because Amazon has been wanting to be an office suite competitor like Google is uh, for for a long time, and this almost feels like them giving up a little and saying, you know what, we're not going to develop it ourselves. There's a lot of good partners out there. Uh, we'll we'll just we'll just be the bundle uh, from from lots of different brands uh, instead of trying to bring it all in house. Well, I, I think that it's very, very interesting because it, number one, uh, A, uh, cheers to Microsoft, because I, I feel like uh, uh, 20 years ago, a, a, as you watched Google uh, make product after product that gave free, very credible, uh, sometimes even more feature-rich alternatives to the kinds of things that the office suite was selling, uh, specifically to the corporate market, 
many of us might have said, oh, well, Microsoft will wane as we go forward. Not the case. Uh, they are stronger than ever. And even now, one of the biggest companies on the planet is looking to build a stable of people to try and erode from them. Essentially, to me, this boils down to one thing. Amazon for Web Services has a lot of corporate clients. When they meet with those corporate clients, now they have a credible opportunity to say, hey, would you also be interested in going with our productivity suite as Microsoft, when they are meeting with their corporate clients that they sell the productivity suite, are saying, hey, would you be interested in switching to Azure? Like, this is basically just their, 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 their competition to that. Yeah, you know, there's there's an angle here where it actually works a little better for AWS because I'm certain Dropbox, Slack, and Smartsheet all pay Amazon to use AWS on the back end, whereas Microsoft pays itself to use yep. Office to use Azure on the back end. Uh, so, you know, also if Microsoft is disappointed with a productivity app, they 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 can redo it themselves. Uh, if Amazon's disappointed with one of these partners, well, they just swap out a new partner, I guess. You know, so it it's a different kind of flexibility there. Well, and and let's say Amazon partners up with Dropbox, right? Supposedly one of the you know larger companies that that the that Amazon the company has been talking to. Yeah, you know, as a potential client, the client might be like, "Well, AWS is great. Don't get us wrong, but yeah, you know, we're really just there's just so many of us, and we got Dropbox already in the mix already. It's just going to get too weird to move on to some probably wonderful product that you've made, Amazon. But if Amazon is like, "Hey, look, it's Dropbox. It's AWS. It's all in one. You really need Microsoft?" Then I think you get some folks either to sign up or switch. I mean, the the biggest thing is going to be price. Uh, uh, competition on this. And also it's getting people over the fact, the reason why Microsoft is still in the position that they're on is because companies don't like switching things. They like it continuing going on the way that it went on. That is what you hear over and over and over and over again. This is not a move fast and break things kind of culture when you're talking about these corporate clients. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of money. Amazon's a big enough name that they could probably build in a competitive price here, but it's interesting that Amazon has to make its own ragtag group to take on the behemoth that continues to be Microsoft 365. Forever may they reign. Also, don't forget Salesforce owns Slack. So there's that interesting weird angle on this where Slack's like going to be part of the Rebel Alliance, but also a member of the Trade Federation. <laughs> I don't know where they were, where to go with that. I, I, I don't. I don't think the Star Wars metaphors. <laughs> yeah, it breaks down there. I actually had to remind myself that Salesforce owned Slack the other day. It was mm. a December news story, and I was like, "Yeah, pre-holiday, huh? That happened." <laughs> yeah, kind of got wiped out in the Christmas rush. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, here are a couple more indications that we are definitely in the age of social video. If you didn't believe it, this might make you believe it. Instagram head Adam Masseri said in a video that the platform, Instagram, will start experimenting use showing users full screen videos over the coming months with recommended videos no longer just restricted to people you are already following. Masseri explained, quote, we're no longer a photo sharing app or a square photo sharing app. He added, quote, we're also going to be experimenting with how we do we embrace video more broadly, full screen, immersive, entertaining, mobile first video. Instagram also confirmed to TechCrunch that it's testing a prototype feature to let creators publish exclusive stories content only for subscribers. TikTok you know, that's that other company that Instagram might be emulating here a little bit. TikTok started rolling out the ability for all users to share three minute videos. The previous limit was 60 seconds, so 3X. The company has been testing longer videos since December, but only with select users. So you may be saying, haven't I seen a video that's longer than 60 seconds? Yeah, probably, but more people are gonna get that functionality a lot more. Yeah, that last part is a, is a rite of passage, right? Twitter Twitter had its moment where it went from 140 to, to 280. Uh, Instagram increased its videos from 15 seconds uh, at one point. So this is just TikTok growing up. Like, all right, fine, we can we can do more than 60 seconds. Uh, Instagram saying we're not a square photo sh sharing app, fellow teenagers. Uh, it really does strike me as 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 Instagram feeling some heat to to, to try to reposition itself. 
and specifically feeling heat in a way that might fundamentally redesign the user interface in a way that when they felt the heat from Vine, they just added video and they were able to do it within its existing UI. When they felt the heat from Snapchat, they were able to add stories and essentially it's its own separate thing. When they first felt the heat from TikTok, they added Reels and Reels has not become quite the, uh, uh, you know, out of the box uh, adoptive success that I think they might have hoped or at least like stories did and like Instagram videos did in terms of dealing with those competitors. I, I don't want to be an alarmist here, but if Instagram is fundamentally changing their user interface from a scroll to a waterfall or a more immersive or a default immersive experience. This, this smells almost a little dig version four to me. Well, wow. A deep that's, cut there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you're like, wait, what's dig the version crowd four? Goes silent. That's the point. Google it. <laughs> yeah. So if, if I can, you know, I, I saw a lot of people being like, this is insane. Instagram is publicly declaring that, you know, it's not a photo app anymore. And it's like, Okay, well, they're not getting rid of photos. Could right. happen, I suppose, but that's not what's happening right now. It sounds like they're just trying to bring reels into the forefront a little bit more rather than it being some other, you know, platform entirely that's buried within Instagram. Instagram has this issue where I know a lot of people love Instagram stories. I often just don't have time to look at all my friends' Instagram stories, but I get them. I like them. It's it's all fine and good, but you've got your people who kind of hang out in stories. Then you have the purists, right? Who are still posting photos, you know, like me or my dog, my dog is an Instagram. And then you, you know, you've, you've, you've got, you've got some real stuff that, that, that is being used by some folks and, and very creatively in fact, and it's just, it's sort of like, where are all the people? So maybe Instagram is really saying we're not merely a photo sharing site, but it's getting a lot of attention that it's making some dramatic change. I'm just not totally sure how dramatic this is rather than trying to have all more features in one place. I guess my only thing is, is that they've already cloned TikTok, right? right. So now the question yeah. is, it's not the features that we have a that 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 the Instagram universe is wanting. It's the UI, and if they're changing the UI, that and we don't know that we don't know that. But this seems like a thing that you might say before you change the UI <laughs> to prepare people so it doesn't just show up one day and everybody starts screaming about it. Uh, if if they do change it, I'm I'm I wonder, I worry. For yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Sarah. That this is not a huge change, even if they do full screen videos uh, for reels to make it look more TikTok like. It's not a huge change in the entire Instagram, but it's a huge change in tone. Uh, well, you know, when yeah. they did stories, they didn't really talk about Snapchat. Adam Mosseri name checked TikTok alongside YouTube. Uh, and when he was like repositioning Instagram as video first, uh, by saying this, so that, that I think is interesting. The windows 11 preview came out Monday and by Thursday, French engineering student, Gustave Montz had it running on a Lumia 950 XL windows phone. I love this. Uh, if you don't remember, Lumia 950 XL was one of the first devices to run Windows 10 mobile uh, and one of the last <laughs> Windows phones ever. Uh, they barely got Windows 10 mobile out the door before they just stopped doing phones. Windows 11 adapts pretty well to a 5.7 inch screen, but the operating system and its animations particularly run pretty slow. Uh, about four years ago, Monts and LinkedIn engineer Binxing Wang started a project now called Lumia WOA to get Windows 10 running on Lumia 950s, like full on Windows 10, not just Windows 10 mobile. And they collected about 15 people on the team working on, the, on this project over there on GitHub. Uh, so the team took and ported drivers, sometimes wrote its own drivers, and all that work made it fairly straightforward to get Windows 11 working on the phone. Uh, they say pretty much everything works except the camera and the battery life, as you might expect, is pretty bad uh, because you're, you're dealing with such old hardware, but, but it works. It's, uh, it's not necessarily practical, uh, but if you're into these sort of like hacking for hacking sake situations, it's kind of fun to see. Lumia, uh, Lumia. Tom, do you have a Lumia on your I don't. I really somewhere. wish I had a Lumia. Uh, yeah, wow. we're doing, we're doing what an upset. Right Tom's yeah, I know. cabinet finally lets us down. 
but yeah, if uh, if you if you want to get involved, if you're like, yeah, this is just kind of the silliness uh, I enjoy, uh, go to go to GitHub, look up the W O A project. You can you can join, increase that that team of 15 people. Uh, I, you'll get your own personal self satisfaction out of it. I don't I don't know that there are any terribly practical things come out of it, but. Uh, yeah, oh, there's a lot knowing of that, knowing that 5.7 inches kind of works, at least looking at that it. That is interesting that the Windows 11's uh, design adapts to that small screen uh, yeah. pr pretty nicely on its own. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Well, on Saturday, in fact, this Saturday, July 3rd, our science correspondent, Doc, Dr. Nikki Ackermans, releases the first episode in a limited series called Seniors in Tech, where she interviews seniors examining how technology has impacted their lives in a variety of ways. The first episode kicks off with Allison Sheridan, and now her engineering background ended up being a gateway to not only technology, but also podcasting. Check out your DTNS feed this Saturday, July 3rd. That's where it will be. Blood. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development released a framework Thursday to set a minimum tax of 15% for the world's 100 biggest companies. Now, that's targeted mostly at tech, but the U.S. was able to get it to just apply to the company no matter what business they're in. It's a standard and legal practice for a company to headquarter itself in a country with a low tax. It's not illegal. Uh, it's not even unethical. It's, it's a thing companies do. They're like, you know what? We will charge our branches in other countries to move our taxable profits into the lowest tax area we operate in. The idea of this new agreement is to dissuade companies from doing that and provide tax revenue for all the countries where a company operates rather than just the one where it headquarters. As such, the agreement acknowledges the right to tax where your customers are not just where a business's physical presence is. That's how this tax works right now. It's like, oh, I'm headquartered in Ireland. All, all of my revenue gets credited to the Ireland branch, and then I pay the low Irish rate. This would allow countries to, without causing a controversy with other countries, set a tax like, no, where your customers are is how we're going to tax you, not where your headquarters is. 130 countries, including China, India, and the United States, agreed to the framework. Only about nine countries did not sign. Uh, or did not agree. That includes Ireland, which has a corporate tax rate well below 15%, uh, and is therefore the European headquarters of pretty much all the big tech companies. But it also includes Estonia, Kenya, Nigeria, Barbados, Peru, Sri Lanka, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Hungary. Uh, some of those, like Kenya and Nigeria, want more uh, reassurances that they won't uh, lose revenue because companies actually have real physical presences in their countries, but the tax ends up going somewhere else. Countries who do sign will agree to pass laws such that the minimum effective corporate tax rate will become 15% for companies that meet the following criteria. Global revenue of $20 billion and a profit margin above 10%. Again, the U.S. pushed for this to be uh, irrespective of what business the company is in, but that 10% profit margin would leave Amazon out. So France lobbied to allow business units to qualify separately from the parent company because the low margin part of Amazon is the retail side and AWS would therefore qualify for the tax. To meet the 15% target, a lot of countries, including the United States, uh, plan to change their tax rules to apply to where the revenue is generated before those transfers, so that transferring profits to low-tax countries would have no advantage because you're going to get taxed on it anyway. U.S. President's administration wants to raise the minimum tax on U.S.-based companies' foreign profits from 10.5%, which is what it is now, to 21%. G20 ministers are meeting to approve the deal July 9th, and details like possible exemptions will be hammered out by October. The new rules are intended to be implemented in 2023 at the earliest. Taxes, man. We're talking about taxes. Uh, uh, I, I think that this is a, a big push. Uh, uh, Biden's administration has made the idea of a global tax a priority, specifically Janet Yellen. Uh, that being said... I think we've got a we've got miles to go before this thing actually happens, and there's a lot of potential uh, of uh, you know pitfalls for it, up to and including the idea of what the exemptions are going to be and whether or not one of these massive players, uh, specifically uh, you know China, India, and the United States, 
for one reason or another, uh, uh, do not see eye to eye and balk on it. That being said, of all the global initiatives, the one that brings in more money uh, into the coffers of these mega powers is something that I do think they can all agree on. Like their self interests are aligned, uh, aside from some of these like kind of famous tax haven company or countries like uh, Ireland and and some of the other ones that you listed. I am uh, I'm fairly confident that that this will get passed somehow that they they will come to an agreement. There's there's too much momentum for it. The tech companies aren't even fighting it. Uh, they, their expressed reason for supporting it is they think it would be better to have clear rules and not this more complex system that that causes them to jump through all these hoops. Uh, the unexpressed reason is probably regulatory capture, uh, yeah. which is like, hey, we're already here at this level of money. So yeah, set a rule that that makes it harder for someone to grow into into our business. Uh, but I, I think there will be something here. I think you're right that what the exemptions are will be very interesting to watch and whether it actually works. You know, the idea is that we're going to tax you anyway, whether you headquarter in Ireland or Barbados or somewhere else. So what's the point? Uh, and uh, whether that that actually happens and whether that dissuades companies uh, from doing that and whether it hurts those countries, uh, which is the other reason that Ireland is against it. They're like, hey, we, we don't want to have everybody suddenly move out of Ireland because of this. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing is, uh, uh, can an international tax framework run faster than all of the accountants on the planet? We'll see. The fact that they got this far stuns me. So I, I'm like, well, shoot, if they could get if they could get this far, there's but like so but like saying there's a chance. It's there. Will it work? That's yeah. the in May, the greatest state in the union, Florida, passed a law prohibiting social media platforms from banning anyone running for public office in Florida. It also stopped platforms from censoring journalistic enterprises based on their content. Through an, uh, though an exemption was given to companies that owned and operated a theme park. I wonder how that got in there. <laughs> Tech trade groups challenged uh, the, the law in court, arguing that it violated a constitutional right to make editorial judgments and was preempted by Section 230, which prevents platforms from being liable for their content moderation decisions. U.S. District Judge Robert Hinkle issued a preliminary injunction preventing parts of the law from taking effect. Judge Hinkle said the law would restrict speech by dictating to platform operators who can use their site and what content they can post. The judge did not find that Florida had showed a compelling public need for the law, writing, quote, leveling the playing field, promoting speech on one side of an issue or restricting speech on the other is not a legitimate state interest, end quote. The state of Florida will appeal the ruling to the 11th U.S. Circuit Court. Uh, I can't wait till this gets to the Supreme Court. Like, let's just put it right in front of uh, Justice Thomas right now. I want to. I want to see what he says because uh, because that's where it's going to end up. Uh, it's it's all about whether the First Amendment applies, and if so, how, uh, and whether Section 230 applies, and if so, how. Uh, this compelling state interest is is one that judges can. Uh, justifiably have different viewpoints on when they're like, hey, but we're talking about campaigns. We're talking about public officials here. Maybe there is a difference. And I could see a, a legal theory being crafted for that. So uh, I, I I know where this is headed and uh, I'll just sit back and, and relax and, and wait for that Supreme Court decision probably next year sometime. For folks who don't follow politics or are, uh, uh, you know, not dialed into the United States flavor of politics, the governor of Florida currently is Ron DeSantis, who is not only up for re-election in the state of Florida, which has become increasingly red over the past few years in 2022, but is also somebody that is a possible uh, 2024 uh, a Republican frontrunner for the presidency of the United States. He's made a couple big, splashy, conservative-leaning uh, uh, legislative pushes lately. This is one of them. But I do agree with you, Tom. This is not quite the slam dunk that I think some people who would be critical of the law think that it is. When you're dealing with uh, a public uh, service, right? Like, is there an element of freedom that you have some um, an, an uncancelability? And also, are you, which side of the First Amendment are you on when you're protecting the rights of journalistic outlets to publish things like that that to me is a legitimate question 
Uh, well, you might have a question about this next story. A coding error has been spotted in a video displaying Sir Tim Berners-Lee's original World Wide Web source code, which recently sold for $5.4 million as an NFT to an unidentified buyer. Now, the NFT included time-stamped files of the source code and an animated video of it being written. It's kind of part of the package. That's what you're buying. But Miko Hypanen from security company F-Secure noticed that the symbols greater than and less than had been translated into HTML as ampersand IT and ampersand GT. The website creator that was showing the video, Mark O'Neill, said it appeared whoever made the video for the website ran the original text file through something that just converted it to HTML. He trusts that the original code is error free, but just goes to show you an NFT little uh, little typo in there. Yeah, no, this is fascinating uh, because I mean, how many times has this happened to you where your your less than and greater than thans become LTs like, and GTs? Uh, I've I've seen that happen a, a million times. And Ars Technica's uh, Tim Deshant uh, speculated that potentially, if the code is fixed. If the video was made off the actual code in the original NFT, that would mean they recreated the NFT. And the way NFTs work, if you recreate one, you don't destroy the original one. Yeah. Uh, and so if that were true, there's a lot of ifs there, a lot of ifs there. But if that were true, sitting on a hard drive somewhere might be the mistaken code, which then becomes the upside down airplane stamp of the NFT world. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what's fascinating to me is that if we are to understand that NFTs are simply just electronic collectibles, then if you look at the collectibles market, the most valuable ones are the ones that are kind of screwed up. Those are the ones that wind up going yeah. for the most amount of money. They're rare, yeah. The rare albino <laughs> World Wide Web NFT. You've only seen in the wild once. If I, the uh, the original went for 5.4 million, but the ampersand LT version, that one, that one went <laughs> yeah, for that one. And That's a special one. $5.4 million. Dollars. I got to say, I expected more. Not that that's not a lot of money, but yeah, sure. seeing yeah. what NFTs do go for, this is a pretty big one. And it's the World Wide Web, for goodness that's sake. That's what I'm saying. Why cheap yeah, out? You're, yeah, uh -huh. you're, using it, you're using it right now, people. Come on. But right now... I still think we're in an emerging market where people don't know like, okay, well that's a cool NFT. Will there be a cooler one that comes out in yeah. weeks that, that is, that is more into my interest of the origins of the web? Like, I don't know. I, I, mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the big question with NFTs in general aren't necessarily what they're selling for now. It's what they're going to resale for in mm -hmm. two years, five years. Right. Right. All right. Let's get to the mailbag. Uh, so we know some of you don't have time to listen to GDI, at least not every day, or you just like to keep it to DTNS. We like to give you options. But Kevin wrote in with some feedback we found warm and fuzzy. Kevin said, today's been a pretty long day. Following a few rough weeks, months, year, I was really feeling it. And then I started today's episode. I was so caught off guard at the flood of positive emotions I felt when the new music started. Talking about GDI. That, along with the bright, cheerful artwork, which we just uh, updated, by the way, has instantly made me feel better and ready to have a good rest of my day. I can't wait to unpause the show and listen to my friends for the next hour. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. That was so nice of you to, to, to write in and tell us that. It made my day uh, to see that. I'm glad that, that we seem to have also possibly made your day. Uh, so yeah. So very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, warm and fuzzies uh, all around. If you, have, if you have anything like that or you, I don't know, you just want to... I don't know. You're having a bad day. You're having a good day. You're having a bad day. You have a question, a comment, anything. We'd like to We'd like to hear it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Be gentle, please, but we'll take it. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Eric Holm, Carmine Bailey, and Matthew Stevens. Also, guess what? Thanks to our brand new bosses, because we got two of them. Alex Oladele and Robert Bigelow. Both are now backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Robert. Oh, my gosh. Two new bosses, two, two. We're just saying, it's you're going to get a lot of love and appreciation if you become a patron of Daily Tech News Show, and That's right. not just from us, from everyone in the in it, the group. You know what it means? Two pieces of pie, not one. That's two. right. That's right. And you know what's better than one piece of pie? Two pieces of pie. That's <laughs> correct. This also it just keeps going. Four is better than three. I et mean, cetera. yeah. That's right. It's true. 
<laughs> Thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Whether you have zero pieces of pie, Justin, or 90, uh, we think you're pretty swell. What else have you been up to? Well, uh, uh, I've, I've been uh, collecting pieces of pie for a podcast series that is now ready to serve. Indeed, all four episodes of World's Greatest Con, my dog and pony show produced a uh, program with Brian Brushwood about Operation Mincemeat, the audacious plan to con Hitler and win World War II is now available uh, it's it's probably the best thing that I've ever produced uh, to to date, and I'm very proud of it. I'd be very very curious to see what everybody thinks now that all the episodes are available, one through four. Head to greatestconpodcast.com or find it on all of the podcast directories you use currently. You heard the man. Check it out. We're also live Monday through Friday on this show. If you'd like to check us out live, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC is what to put on your calendar. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back doing it all again tomorrow with Chris Ashley and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>